quite a number, a large number of our guys are up at Fall Creek Falls uh, at the men's retreat. I was up there with them all day yesterday, and I can report that they are behaving reasonably well. Uh, <laughs> that's the best I can say for that bunch, uh, but reasonably well. That's pretty good. We're proud of them for that much. Um, I had the privilege of speaking to them last night, and so uh, uh, after we had dinner, uh, I spoke. What's that? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I spoke to them, and uh, afterwards we had a rather long discussion uh, period. Um, and I got home about uh, well, eleven fifteen to eleven thirty, somewhere along there, and then got up very early this morning. So. Uh, if I fall asleep while I'm preaching, if you folks would leave quietly <laughs> so, so as not to disturb me, I would appreciate it, all right. Um, sometimes people ask me about my favorite passage in the Bible, and I have several, um, but one that, that I want to talk about today has become a real favorite of mine, and that's... John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. Four chapters. I'm not going to read all that. I'm not going to preach everything in that today. Uh, but uh, I wanted you to notice one thing about those four chapters. Almost every bit of it is red letter. That means these are the words of Jesus. The only parts of this, these four chapters that are not red letter is when somebody, when Luke told us that one of the disciples asked him a question and very briefly and then he continued and it's in red letter it is a magnificent passage of scripture it almost stands alone as a piece of literature and I encourage all of you uh, to go home sometime today or tomorrow when you get a chance and read those four chapters these four chapters contain the teachings of Jesus regarding his imminent departure from the earth and his promise to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide his disciples in all truth. After three intense years of intimate fellowship, training, suffering, and sharing, this is a very difficult time for Jesus. He had grown to love these disciples in a human way as well as in a spiritual way. And no doubt this was a, a, a painful time for him as he uh, considered and reflected upon uh, his soon-to-be departure from their, these disciples. Let's also consider it was a very difficult time for them. They had grown to love him in a human way, as well as in a spiritual way. They loved him as their master and teacher, but also as their brother and as their friend. And what made it worse for them is they didn't yet fully comprehend the full significance of the events that lay just a few days ahead of them in Jerusalem. They were still struggling with what the kingdom means and what, what that was all going to be about. And now when Jesus tells them, I'm going away, you know they had to be devastated. But Jesus is preparing them for something far more important than their personal grief and loss, which would result from his departure. He was putting the finishing touches on the emergence of the kingdom in its fullest earthly expression. And he was preparing them for the greatest task that's ever been planned, the carrying out of the Great Recommission. I know you all call it the Great Commission. Abraham gave it first in Genesis 12. This is the Recommission. So I would like to call it the Great Recommission. But it says, go and make disciples of all the nations. What an incredible task you've given us. How can we possibly do what you're asking us to do, Lord? How can we gain the world for Christ? Today I want to talk to you about some absolute requirements if we ever hope to do that. I want to talk to you about unity and revival. And I want to start by talking about diversity. Okay? 
Jesus chose 12 guys to be his closest companions during this three-year ministry. I don't know how much you know about the disciples. I think we know a lot about Peter and, and maybe some about John. Uh, but uh, some of the other names, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, you know, we don't know much about them. But I'm a, I want to tell you something. This was one of the most incredibly diverse group of people you've ever met. I want to tell you a little bit about each. You know Peter. He was impulsive, willing to walk out on a raging sea, and then he had lost his faith a little bit and started to sink. But at least he stepped out there. He, he gave it a shot. You know, always the first to speak hopping around most of the time with one foot in his mouth because uh, he was the first to speak. And sometimes, uh, as my daddy used to say, got his mouth in motion before his brain was in gear. Yeah, Peter was that impulsive uh, person. Thomas, on the other hand, was far more cautious. He demanded absolute proof before he would believe something and really commit to it. I got to see the, I got to see the scars. I got to feel the, the nail prints. I'm not going to believe it if I, don't, if I don't see it with my own eyes. Then there was Simon the Zealot. He wanted violent revolution against Rome. In today's terminology, he would be classified as a political radical. No doubt about it. Judas Iscariot was even a little further along than him. Judas Iscariot was one of those dagger men who was plotting a violent revolution against Rome. I, I think, although some disagree with me, I think that uh, Judas Iscariot uh, joined this little band of disciples because he thought that through Jesus, his nationalistic flame and dreams might be realized, and when he didn't see that happening, he turned Jesus in. Yeah, I, I kind of think that was the motive behind it. He betrayed him. But, but let us not forget one thing. It was not Judas' betrayal that sent Jesus to the cross. It was mine. Let's don't forget that. Jude is also referred to as Jude the Zealot, apparently a Jewish nationalist seeking liberation from Rome. Matthew was the sellout. He'd spent years being a tax collector for these hated oppressors, the Romans. Bartholomew. Bartholomew was from the little town of Cana in Galilee, and a number of scholars believe that he was probably the only disciple who came from royal blood or noble descent. His name means son of Talmai. And if you go back into 2 Samuel chapter 3, Talmai was the king of Geshur, and his daughter was Micah, who was married to David, and who was the mother of Absalom. So, here's, here's a, a nobility guy in the crowd. You got a nobility guy, a tax collector, three or four uh, ra radicals and revolutionaries. James and John were brothers. Jesus gave them the name Boanerges, which means th sons of thunder. Whatever else that may mean, they were hot-tempered and impetuous and unpredictable. Um, several of the disciples were simple fishermen from the region of Galilee. By the way, that was a region known far and wide for its political radicalism. Jesus was from the little town of Nazareth in Galilee. Of that town, it was once said, can any good thing come out of that place? In many ways, the disciples that Jesus chose demonstrate in a powerful way the claim that Jesus can make disciples out of all kinds of people. And that there are numerous ways to respond to God in, in humanity. Looking at this diversity, my weird brain asks a bunch of questions. What would be the likely stresses that might have arisen in a group like this over political and social issues? You reckon they might have argued about some stuff politically? <laughs> there was one, uh, Luke records one time when they were arguing and Jesus heard what they were arguing about and confronted them about it. You know what they were arguing about? 
When the kingdom comes, Lord, who's going to get to sit at the right hand? Who's going to sit at the left? Who's going to be the big dog? Who's going to be the little dog? They were arguing about status, political power, because they didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. If they'd understood what Jesus was all about and what he was up to, they wouldn't have been having this argument in the first place. But then I wonder, who started that argument? Was it Simon the Zealot? Was it Judas the Zealot? Or was it Bartholomew of the royal bloodline? Or maybe it was Judas Iscariot? Or maybe it was that Peter, he's always the first to speak. Maybe he started that, I don't know. But they were arguing. And I suspect this was not the only argument they had. Before we become too judgmental in our attitude toward these men, let's remember that we share something profound with them, in common with them, their humanity. We argue about politics too, don't we? We argue about social issues, what's the best way to do this, who will be the best candidate to solve our problems, what are our problems, are they really problems? The gospel narrative portrays these men as very human, like me in a lot of ways, slow to learn, slow to believe, especially when they were faced with some of Jesus' most piercing insights. They were maddeningly literal when Jesus was trying to speak to them in symbols. (laughs) They were stuck in the past when he was trying to teach them something new. The more I read the Gospels, the more I'm amazed at Jesus' patience with this bunch. With his, the absence of uncontrollable frustration, I wonder why he did, didn't just dump them all and start over. Well, these twelve apostles, though, are among the most famous men in history. Their images are engraved, painted, and sculpted on cathedrals and churches all over the world. They've all been the subject of books and articles and poems and song. Twelve poor, uneducated, and otherwise obscure men who lived in a tiny little kingdom being dominated by the awesome Roman Empire 2,000 years ago are still relevant today. Think about that. If it hadn't been for Jesus, we'd have never known their name. They were that obscure, and they are still relevant today. Their relevance comes not from their humanity and their failures or even from their triumphs. Their relevance comes from the fact that they represent the various ways that humankind can respond to God. Now ask another question. We've talked about these disciples. What kind of a leader would it have taken to hold a bunch like that together? What kind of a man could walk up to a tax collector and say, follow me, and the guy just gets up and follows him? What kind of person are we dealing with here? What kind of overwhelming, charismatic, magnificent personality are we looking at here? Well, the final section of of this passage I'm talking about today gives us some answers into the kind of person that we're looking at. The kind of person who could have taken this incredible diversity and turned the world right side up. Yeah, I said right side up. You remember in Acts where it says these men have come to turn the world upside down? That wasn't God talking. That was some troublemakers. The world was already upside down. They came to turn it right side up. Let's don't forget that. That's not God's description of the world. That it was already right side up. They, it was upside down. Make no mistake. Is it still upside down? Yeah, we're still, and God's still calling us on, to turn it right side up. All right. This section of John's gospel begins with these words. It was just before the Passover feast. Now, we know what happened at the Passover feast. The Lord's Supper was instituted. What happened the very next day and the next day after that? Jesus was arrested. He was tried crucified, buried, 
rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. But Jesus knew, and he told them in John 13, verse 1, that it's time for me to leave and go back to the Father. What's the next thing he did? Wash the disciples' feet. Then he predicts his betrayal at the hands of Judas in John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. Then he predicts Peter's denial. But first he lays down one of the fundamental principles of the kingdom he came to bring to earth. And I'm going to read it to you. It's John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give to you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by what, Lord? By the way you love each other. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Oh, I thought it was baptism. I thought it was that we didn't use instruments. I thought it was... I thought, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That's powerful, folks. That's fundamental. That's baseline stuff. I, I tried to imagine uh, when he made that statement if there had been a bunch of fundamentalist preachers in the crowd. Lord, uh, aren't you leaving out a, a lot of doctrinal requirements that we need to know about here? Love one another. <coughs> yeah, Lord, but what are we going to do about these women? Love one another. Aren't there some important things we've got to get right first? Love one another. That's the way they're going to know. Lord, we're really confused here now. Uh, we don't know what we're supposed to do. Listen to what I've just told you. Love one another. Foundation of the kingdom, right? Jesus has announced to them that he's going to leave and uh, he's going to a place where they cannot yet come. Can you even begin to imagine the impact that that announcement would have on these guys who followed him through so much as they walked the dusty roads of Galilee and Judea? From this point on at the beginning of John, it's a red letter. These are his final instructions for his disciples. And I want to summarize them for you very briefly. First, he begins by trying to comfort them. Let not your hearts be troubled. You know their hearts were troubled. But he says, don't, don't be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I do that, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, they, there you may be also. Then Philip says, well, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know where we're going? And before you go, by the way, before you go, will you do us one big favor? Would you show us the Father? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because he's in me and I'm in him. And then he said a real strange thing, and I'm in you and you're in me. Therefore, if they've seen you, they ought to see the Father. You ought to be seeing the Father in each other. Right? Right? Absolutely. I love these amens. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. In John 14, 15 through 31, contains Jesus' promise that he's not going to leave them as orphans. I'm going to send the comforter, another comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, to counsel you, to remind you of everything I've said to you, and to guide you in all truth that I haven't said to you yet. Chapter 15 contains his famous teachings about the vine and the branches. You know what that means? I'm going back to heaven. You're still connected to me. Just like the branches on that vine, you're still going to be connected to me, even though I'm going to leave this world. Then he returns to talk about the Holy Spirit, tells them that when the counselor comes, he'll convict the world with regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then he promises them something incredible. Though you're going to grieve, your grief will turn to joy. 
just as a mother's labor pains are forgotten when she experiences the birth of her child. I wish I could understand that as clearly as many of the women in here understand that. But Jesus says that, that pain and, and sorrow and grief that you're experiencing today is going to turn to great joy. Now, having said all that, what's it time for? Time for prayer. It's time for prayer. First, Jesus prays for himself, and his prayer is very simple and very obedient. First, he acknowledges to his Father, the time has come. I know what I came here for, and I know it's time for that all to be consummated. I'm ready. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. I've completed the work you sent me to do. Now I want to return to the glory that I had before the world began. That's his simple prayer for himself. Then he turns his attention to his disciples. And I, this is powerful. He thanks the Father for them, for their faith. He prays that they'll be sanctified, set apart by the truth they've received from him. He prays for their protection in the power of his name. And then he gets down to the bottom line. I pray, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. My prayer is not for them alone, not for these twelve, but for all who are going to come to me through their message. And I pray also that they will be one as we are one. Church Jesus is praying for Stones River. He's praying for North Boulevard. He's praying for all the churches, every disciple who's ever come to him through the teachings of these, of these 12 men. What does he pray for? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that they may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Why is this prayer for unity so important? Well, listen to the reason Jesus gives when he's talking to God. May they be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus doesn't pray for unity so that we'll all agree on everything. Incidentally, there is not one shred of evidence anywhere in the Gospels that Jesus ever asked his disciples to lay aside their political differences, their theological differences, or any of their differences. He just asked them to agree on one thing, I'm the Son of God. That's the only thing he ever asked them to, to, to agree on. Do we have disagreements about politics? Yeah. Do we have disagreements about socioeconomic issues? Yeah. Can we be brothers and sisters? Yeah. Absolutely. Jesus never asked these guys to quit being who they were or to drop their opinions and beliefs on issues. He said, come together on one thing. I am the living Son of God. That's what binds us together. I pray that they may be one. Why? So that the world will believe that you sent me. What's Jesus declaring here? In just a few days, he's going to be wrongfully tried before Pilate, condemned to death, crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. He's going to be lifted up to unleash heaven's power and to draw all men to himself. And then after three days, he's going to be raised from the dead to unleash heaven's power over death and bring mortality, immortality to mortal flesh. And finally, he's going to tell his disciples that it's their responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and I'm with you to the end of the age. What's the underlying requirement for all of this? that they may be one in us, or nobody's going to believe this message. As Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples, and for the eleven, and for all who would come after them, by the way, there's only eleven now, Judas is gone. 
he recognizes one critical principle. Carrying out the gospel, the Great Commission or the Great Recommission is based upon one fundamental requirement that they may be one in us so that the world may believe you sent me. Jesus doesn't pray for unity so we'll be happy. Jesus doesn't pray for unity so that we'll get along or so we'll get all of our doctrinal disagreements straightened out or that we'll agree on politics or socioeconomic issues or anything else. He prays that we will be one in order to get the job done. What's the job? Go make disciples of all the nations. We've already noted that among the twelve there was extreme diversity, political, socioeconomic, even religious and theological. And again, no evidence that Jesus ever asked them to lay all that aside. There was as much diversity in the first century church as there is in the 21st century church. I mean, there were Jewish-Gentile disagreements. When the Gentiles were brought in, there was conflict even between Paul and Peter. Paul said, I withstood him to the face because he was wrong. But there were brothers. They didn't lay that aside. As the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, as Luke says, the early church embraced every conceivable philosophy every imaginable culture, every language spoken in the world, every lifestyle you can think of. But the gospel spread like flame throughout the world because they were united around one thing. Jesus is the resurrected Son of God who gave his life as a ransom for the world. The most thorough record we have of this spreading flame is in the acts of, some of the acts of some of the apostles. That's a better name for that book. The book that Luke wrote is a companion to Luke's gospel, the, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I'm going to put a little chart up on the board. And I'll run through this quickly. Uh, Kyle, you up there? All right. Huh, there we go. I went through the book of Acts and I found examples of unity and then looked at the outcomes. I want to share this with you. Give me the first one. Acts 2, 44 through 46. This is right after Pentecost. They They were together. They had all things in common and they were with one accord. Look at the outcome. And the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. Look at the next one. Acts 6, 5 and 6. The proposal pleased the whole group. They were united. And so they chose seven men to serve these Grecian widows. Look at the outcome. And so the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied. Give me the next one. The churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. Peace. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied me the next one. After Peter was imprisoned by Herod in Acts chapter 5, we are told that constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Look what happened. The word of God grew and multiplied. Look at the next one. This is Jerusalem Council. Well, this was a biggie. They were arguing about were, were Christians, Gentile Christians to be circumcised. They argued about that, and they argued about it. So all got together, came up with a joint proposal, and the churches were strengthened in faith. And they, their numbers increased daily. Are you just impressing you? It does me. Give me the next one. The Ephesians came together collectively and repented of their idolatry. And what? In this way, the word of the Lord grew mightily and spread. One last one. The brothers in Rome had heard that we were coming, so they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. Don't put the next one up yet. I walked that road. I walked on the Appian Way when Diane and I were in Rome a few years back. 
I know how far it is. They walked a long way, 70, 80 miles down there to Appius just because they were excited that Paul was coming. They were so, so together on this thing. And look what happened. Paul lived for two years under house arrest and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught Jesus Christ. Folks, if we can come together, if we can be united around the central truth of the gospel, Jesus is the resurrected Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. We can take this world for Christ. Without that unity, it ain't happening. I'm convinced <clears throat> that the roughly five billion people in the world today who have not named the name of Jesus will not come to faith if the responsibility for getting them the message rests on the shoulders alone of people with Church of Christ on their sign in the front yard. It ain't happening. Currently, there are about three million people in the world who are affiliated with the Churches of Christ. That's .0005% of the world's population. Approximately 2 million of these live in the U.S. where we make up only 1.5% of the population of the United States. We will not make disciples of all the world until all who claim the name of Jesus come to understand the common bond that binds us together and that faith creates and maintains. Jesus' final command, and I love the name of that organization. It is his final command. Jesus' final command was to all his disciples and to all who would come after them. With all of their diversity, and his prayer for unity was for all his disciples to come together around the central truth of God's revelation. If Jesus' example means anything to us, then believers in the mighty name of Jesus will lay aside the sin of exclusion which so easily besets us and join our hands and hearts in obedience to Jesus' final command. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the living word who walked upon this earth. We're thankful for the example he left behind. We're thankful for the prayer he prayed. And we ask for its fulfillment in our day in our time, in our now, in Jesus' name.